right, everybody, road trip. Um, you know, you have to get your snacks together, figure out who you want to sit next to for the next five hours, and um, buckle your seatbelts, not because it's going to be some wild and exciting ride, but because it's likely to be uneven, if you know what I mean. Um, and you're going to need a map, right? You can't take a road trip without a map, and that's really a big part of the subtext of what I want to talk about today is actually maps. That's as much about what this talk is about as the metaphorical look out the window. So um, we could use this map. We could use this map in almost any metropolitan area in New York um, because it exquisitely captures the kind of spread city that we are inheriting. And there are two things about this map that I want to emphasize, right? The first is where it came from, right? This is a cartoon from the New Yorker last month, and which tells me that, as Sprawl did 20 years ago, this idea of a spreading city has now made its way into the general public consciousness. And the other thing that's even more important is to know that this is not a critique of Sprawl, right? It says nothing about aesthetics, whether Sprawl is ugly, that's typically what we would say, and it says nothing about the kind of discontinuity of the suburban landscape, right, about not being able to get from here to there. In fact, this place is incredibly connected. It's so connected, in fact, that the real problem for our poor friend here and for us is this kind of loss of a coherent mental map of the region. Okay, well, you can say no problem. We're going to sort of look out the window, and we know that we can expect to see a kind of a transect, right, of things that go from urban to suburban to exurban to rural, and that'll help us get oriented. But actually what's going to happen when we look out the window is almost everything we see is going to be very much in between. It's not really going to fit into any of those categories. And most of the policies that we want to calibrate to that transect really have to, so there's going to be a lot of work to make those work in a lot of these different pieces of the landscape. Um, and so what's going to happen is, as this pattern has matured, all those dots on the map are starting to grow together. And so this landscape is not so much about a transect as an intersect, about patterns beginning to grow into each other and create a bunch of crazy collisions, right? So we can expect to see high schools next to landfills. We can expect to see multifamily housing developments on commercial strips where they're right next door to a drive through bank. Um, you know, we can expect to see 1,200 square foot single family homes up against 200,000 and 300,000 square foot warehouse and distribution facilities, right? So we have to get maybe a different kind of map, right? This actually isn't a map at all. It's an image from a, a textbook, a biology textbook about species hybridization. And what I think is interesting is I think maybe the thing that we need to do is embrace this lumpy landscape and look at all these kinds of crazy collisions and what they're producing and think about kind of hybrid places, hybrid building typologies that we might want to use and different forms of mixed use, right? So that mixed use isn't just, you know, mom and dad living above the store uh, on a cozy main street. Mixed use might be that suburban industrial park that if we cut it loose, uh, we allow it to be adopted. The, adapted in various ways. The buildings can get chopped up, right? There's been this revolution in production where a factory now might be some guy's 3D printing machine on his kitchen table. So we can imagine uses, mixed uses that we may not have imagined before. And I was very talk taken last night by Doug Saunders, who was talking about this idea of arrival cities, which are places that because of their density and proximity, they enable this kind of agglomeration of activities to take place, right? So maybe what can happen is if we cut these places loose, places like industrial parks and things like that, take away the regulations and let the changing demographic out there take it over, it might be possible that these can actually become places, little nodes of innovation, and become little mini arrival cities in and of themselves. So since this is an inaugural lecture for a design program, I want to sort of finish with two slides. Um, the first one is to talk about maps and mapping, right? Just like the little guy at the corner of that map, the students here and the teachers, you know, you're going to have access to more data than anyone has ever had access to in the history of this profession. And you will do, as I see people in my office, you will be able to make map after map after map. 
and I fear for the trees in the Pacific Northwest as drawings roll off of the, off of the plotter. And what you need to do as a designer is to grow an attitude sooner rather than later and begin synthesizing these maps in a way that begins to tell a story. You may not get it right the first time and people may object, but if you do that, you can actually begin to filter all of this information in a way that can actually, you know, people can begin to um, understand. And you better be prepared to make all different kinds of maps. Not just maps that you can make out of a plotter in GIS, maps that you can draw by hand, interactive maps that you can send people to, to the public to deal with in different ways. And since a lot of the people that you're going to be dealing with don't look like you and they don't have your perspective, um, you better be prepared to make maps that also have used different kinds of materials and that speak to people in different kinds of ways. So on this road trip, I can imagine people are saying now, you know, are we there yet? And I guess from the perspective of my talk, we just about are. But I'm here to tell you that from the perspective of the larger challenge that I'm putting to this program, um, we're not nearly there and we're not likely to get there. And in fact, in some ways, the idea is not to get there at all. Um, two researchers, uh, Rittle and Weber in 1967, coined the phrase, a wicked problem. And a wicked problem is a problem that doesn't lend itself to a sort of defined or definitive solution because there's so many more variables than there will ever be equations that you can't hope to ever actually get a definitive answer. What you can hope to do, and this is where your role as a designer is very important, is you can, if you're a smart designer, bring people together for a kind of conversation, a synthetic conversation, that actually begins to at least move the discussion forward. And so, no pressure here, but for those of you who are the designers here, I would like to suggest to you that it is not really an overstatement to say that the survival of the species depends on your ability to not just do, to not just design beautiful landscapes and beautiful places, but to design beautiful conversations. Thank you.